Good morning. How's my family this morning? You know, I get to doing everything in the mornings and I forget to put my mic on and I have to go back and get my mic and get it put on. And so I apologize for being late getting up here. I thought Buster was going to have to come tell a joke. How's everybody today? Beautiful day. Weather's nice. It's been a little cool, but, uh, you know, I missed you guys last weekend. Uh, you know, every once in a while I take a little time off so I can maybe refresh and bring you a more uh, uh, flavorable sermon each time instead of the same old thing all the time. So that's what I try to do. No fishing right now. <laughs> it's the... yeah. I have a question for everyone this morning. That question is, do you consider yourself rich or wealthy? That's something to think about, right? There you go. If you answered yes or no, you may be richer than what you think. Some people are sitting there and go, well, I don't consider myself rich or I don't consider myself wealthy. According to history, though, many of you may possess something in your home that at one time was worth more than gold. Probably each and every one of you possess something in your home which at one time was more valuable than gold itself. In fact, it's something that you'd keep in your kitchen that you might not even think about. Anyone have a guess what I'm talking about? Not you. You know the sermon. If you said salt, you were correct. You were absolutely correct. Salt is not just a seasoning agent you find in the, your kitchen. It's not just that. Or in your drawers or in salt shakers or in restaurants. It's not just that. In fact, the evolution of humans begins, I'm sorry, the evolution of human beings depends on its chemical properties to survive. You go, really? How's that work? You know, back in the day, the, the way salt got started is it came from, came from the sea. They would take salt water and they'd store it in big urns and things and just let it, let it evaporate and dry and the salt would wind up in the bottom. And that's how they, they created salt for a long, long time. It took a long time also for them to create salt and to have it. So it's very important. And nowadays, seeing that salt is readily available, it's easy for us to get a hold of salt at any time. Now, it makes people underestimate the rich history of salt in the day, of what it, what it all entailed, and how important and how valuable salt is, really, in our lives. We, we kind of take it for granted because it's easy for us to get now. Because at one point, salt was more valuable than gold itself in a time. Salt was so valuable that people used it the same way people use money today for trade. They use salt for trade. They used it as just like cash, just like money. And since the production of salt was legally restricted in ancient times, many of you might not know that, but it was. It was legally restricted in ancient times. It was used as a method of trade or currency, used a lot in that way. So people used salt to pay workers instead of cash. The Romans, the Romans paid their soldiers that way. They paid them in salt instead of cash. So you've got to think about what was salt really worth? If it was worth more than gold at the time? Salt's ability to preserve food was a founding contributor to the development of civilization. Because it made transporting food over long distances possible. Do you know on a chuck wagon, salt was one of the number one commodities needed on a chuck wagon because it helped preserve so much stuff. So it was used. It was sought after more than, more than anything else on chuck wagons of all they carried on. You know, they carried coffee, beans, all that was important. But the salt on a chuck wagon was very important because it helped them transport, transport food on these trail drives. The farmer's almanac offers several uses of salt that many of us uh, would not even consider using it for. Some of you may, you may know, know all about salt and what its uses are. It's said to restore some of the color to faded fabric, soak it in strong solution of salt and water. It will restore some of your color in your fabric. A mixture of salt and vinegar will clean brass. And if you spill fruit juice on a cloth tablecloth, pour salt on the spot, immediately it leads to absorb the stain. It will take it right out and then you wash it. And you can refresh your household sponges by soaking them in salt water for 10 minutes. Make them like new. 
And guys, this one's for you, and we probably all need this. For those perspiration stains on your ball caps, add enough water to salt to make a paste, then rub it into the area. Wait one hour, and then wash it out. And it'll take it right out. That kind of comes in handy. Because many of us will wear them ball caps till they look terrible. <laughs> I don't know about all them other stains you get on them, that's for sure. <laughs> and there's so many more uses for salt. Most of us understand that without salt, sometimes the food we eat can be fairly bland or no taste at all. Now, some people say salt's not good for you. That's not true. Salt is good for you. Everybody needs salt and balance in your diet. Salt adds flavor. It preserves, permeates the food that it's sprinkled on, which causes a significant difference in its flavor. You know, ever ate mashed potatoes without salt or a baked potato without salt? Oh, terrible. It's bland. So whatever you add it to, it gives it some flavor. It gives it a little bit of taste, right? As Christians... We should all know the importance of salt because it is referenced 47 times in the Bible itself. 47 times, salt. Also, nowhere in the Bible is the word sugar even used. Even though we are called to be flavorful people, sugar is not used anywhere in the Bible. And my wife sent me this. This was cool. This is a text while I was working on this message. She sent this to me. It says, the church cannot be the salt of the earth if we keep sugarcoating the gospel. Amen. Right? This is so true. We should never sugarcoat the truth of the Bible. Ever. Just lay it out there. It is what it is. Right? And salt was an important part of ancient Hebrew religious sacrifice also. That's how salt came into play. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 13. If you join me there this morning. Once again, I hope you brought your Bible. Let's look at God's Word, not mine. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings and add salt to all your offerings. Here, 1 Timothy tells us that God wants all people to be saved. And come to know the knowledge. Come to know the knowledge of truth. First Timothy tells us that, and that's what all this ties into. He wants each of us to live in such a way that we influence others for their spiritual good. We are to function in the same way as salt by spreading the appeal of Christ as we interact with other people. How about that? Let's add some flavor to it, right? That's what there's. What he's saying here. Jesus shares. Just two words to illustrate our missions in our life. The mission in our life, Jesus used only two words. And those two words were salt and light. Amen? Two words. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. If you join me there. Matthew chapter 5, you know, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it may be, be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Right here in this scripture, Jesus warns us that the saltiness of our lives will decrease, be less, if ungodly habits and chronic sin render us tasteless. Think about that. We need to be flavorful, right? That's what he keeps telling us. So we don't need to lose our saltiness. And that's easy to do if we get caught up in the world and worldly things. Salt during the biblical days was often mixed with other minerals and was not very pure at all. So if someone tried to wash the minerals away, they could end up washing away the salt instead. Causing the salt to lose its taste. If more minerals were left than the actual salt, it would often be thrown out into the street to keep the dust down and trampled underfoot. How about that? If it lost its saltiness, it was thrown out and trampled underfoot. The metaphor here is the same. 
the same for us. When we lose our saltiness for God, what good are we? What good are we? Are we just being, we're just being thrown out, thrown away? Possibly. We're letting that happen to ourselves. So we need to stay fruitful and we need to stay excited. And that's where the fruitfulness comes in. We need to stay excited about the gospel and about the truth of Jesus Christ. Because salt is the quality of our own personal integrity. How does that work? Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So we need to be, we need to be excited about the Lord. We need, to, we need to show others of what God has done for us. Paul has presented evangelism as a work of prayer. A work of clear communi communication and a manner of wisdom. So Paul's saying, okay, I, I have prayer. We should all have prayer, lead people in prayer. We need to have clear communications with the other people when we're talking to them about Jesus Christ. And it wouldn't hurt to have a little wisdom about who you're talking about, right? That comes as a, as a no-brainer right there that we need to have a little knowledge. And how do you gain that knowledge? You read your Bible. You do not have to be a... You know, a, a scholar in, in biblical terms. You don't have to do that. Just know the basics. Know who Jesus Christ is. Know what he was about. It's that simple. Titus chapter 1 verse 9. This little piece of scripture we use a lot to identify what an elder's role is. Or what a leader in the church role is. But this, this actually applies to everyone. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So you need to be able to at least acknowledge who God is, who Jesus Christ is, what he done for, done for you and all. But you also need to be able to challenge people when they say there is no God. Right? I don't believe in Jesus Christ. You need to be able to challenge people and defend the gospel that it, is, that, that it is a reality. That, that it is. And, and you do that. How do we do that? We do that by being salty. Being flavorful. And being the light. Right? We do that by reflecting what Jesus Christ has done for us. And what he's doing for us today. Because sometimes we, Jesus Christ, he's got it all going on in our lives. But we're not sharing it. The things that are happening to us, are we giving credit to Jesus Christ? We should be. And if we are, then we need to be sharing it. This is what he's doing for me. I believe in him. This is why I believe in him. And I believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God. Some people go, how can you believe all that? Well, you either do or you don't. You know, it's kind of like this. People don't believe in hell, but there's a heaven and a hell. And somebody's going to be in one and the other, right? There's no sugar coating that. There is a hell and there are going to be people that are there. The Bible is pretty clear about that. So it's your choice. Right? It's all of us' choice. We can choose where we want to be, but you better choose, you better choose wisely. <laughs> right? There you go. Not smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> We've always said there are a lot of people going to get in heaven. Some are going to have a little smoke smell on them when they get there, right? You know, mere knowledge is not all that's required. Just the knowledge. You don't just have to have the knowledge. In order to give an answer... In a truly Christian way, a person must present truth using proper words and the proper attitude, right? I don't care how country you are. If you talk like my wife, she can still get it across, right? She's as country as they get. She talks as country as she gets, but she knows the Word of God. She's got the attitude. She's got the excitement. She's got the flavor, and she wants everybody else to have that also. I say she's like a bug light. She just draws people in, right? That's the way we all need to be. That's the flavor that God's talking about right here. How do we be flavorful? We are the salt. And we add to it. Brother, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. I'm going to tell you that right now. To lead others to know Jesus Christ. You don't have to do that. Your life reflects that. Amen. In Paul's time, salt served primarily as a preservative. Keeping meat from spoiling. And you think, how does that work? Have you? I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, when I was growing up, we slaughtered hogs. My grandfather had a big pig farm. 
and they slaughtered hogs and they'd cut them up. And they'd cut up that meat and they'd salt it down and they'd just put it in an old smokehouse. They just put it in there. And I mean, there's flies, there's everything. There's, you know, it's no big deal. It's, but you've rubbed it down with salt and you've completely covered it with salt and it preserved it. And many of you that are my age or older, you know what I'm talking about. We didn't have that refrigeration. You're going to grab it and throw it in a refrigerator or something like that. You salted it down and let it sit there. I see you shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about. That was part of it. And that's some of the best pork you could ever eat. Same thing with beef or anything. It, it preserves that well. And, of course, it changes the flavor of whatever it is added to. In that regard, Paul's use of the metaphor has more than one meaning. The believer's words are to preserve the message of Christ, helping it effectively reach as many people as possible. What a Christian says ought to add value to the conversation. Remember, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say it. Right? Everything you say should be uplifting to another person.
Christians posting things that are not pleasing to the Lord. And I would have issues with that. You profess to be a Christian, but you use this kind of language and these kind of things in your Facebook post. So please, don't profess to be a Christian if you're going to do that. Don't do that. You know, you're, you're going strictly against God's word. You're going strictly against God. You're using it in a way that's not pleasing to God, right? We see people doing that a lot. You know, maybe they don't think anything about it. You know, uh, the thinking nowadays, especially in the younger generation, I don't know where that's all coming from. Terry and I was watching a deal the other day, and a little girl was talking about her mom being arrested at school, wasn't it? Yeah, at the school she was at. And she goes, oh, she didn't do anything bad. She just stole some license plates off another car and put them on hers. <laughs> now, think about that. That's the thinking of the younger generation. You no, know, it's no big deal. What's well, a big deal? You're handcuffed going to jail? <laughs> Come on. So I think somewhere along that line, we've got to change some of that thinking. We've. and you made it all dark. Well, that's how Laren is. Since the presence can't, you know, it, it, what it does, it, it just, it diminishes the light in the lantern. All at once it's turned black and you don't have light coming out. Well, sin's presence can be just like that. It can cloud our testimony and it can reduce our influence on others because they don't have a clear picture of who we are or what we stand for. John chapter 1, verse 4. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It is the common composition of salt and the clarity of light that gives them both the power they have. Real simple. Our character and who we are, even when no one's looking, helps or hurts our ability to have a positive impact on others. Who? Because I'll assure you, God's always looking. I'd say to you today, may we be the salt and the light for Christ to guide and influence others to know the value of accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That our lives and words would help lead the lost to an eternal life through Jesus Christ. Let's be that salt. And let's be that light for Jesus Christ. John chapter 11, verse 5. We're going to close right here. John chapter 11, being verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Amen. Promises from God. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this beautiful day to you, Father. We thank you just for that. Father, we thank you for this, your presence here in this building today. Father, we thank you for each and every one here. Father, that they've taken the time to come and be in praise and worship to you. Father, I pray that we all seek to be the salt and light for you. Father, that we would inspire others with our words and with our actions that would bring just happiness to you, that you would be pleased in the way we handle that. Father, sometimes we can fall down. We get into worldly things and we start following the world or we get beat up so bad that we just 
draw back and we start to lose that saltiness and we no longer are the light to others. So, Father, I pray that you protect us from that, that you protect everyone here. Father, that you would inspire them, that you would encourage them as you do through your word, Father. I pray that each and every one here that would take the time to open their Bibles and learn more about Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We praise you. I pray today that everything we did was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.